Church, let's jump right into it. Let's go to the book of Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 4. We have finally made it after about, I don't know, three long months. We finally made it into the, the fourth quarter of this book, and we are going to enter into chapter 4 today, the book of Philippians. We've got a lot of ground to cover this morning. You know me by now. I usually preach one or two verses a week. Today we have seven, so we're going to try to make our way quickly through this so that we're not here until three or four in the afternoon. Although I, I've often wondered how long I could preach before people really just had enough. I, I, I just wanted to say, like, well, maybe do that as a social experiment one day and just keep going. Just not stop and just keep going and see, you know, if you guys can make it a couple hours before you start looking and saying, I, I, th- I think he should be wrapping up about now. But we're going to be in the book of Philippians chapter 4. So if you'd grab your copy of God's Word. Uh, we've been, we talked about it a little bit this morning, uh, Mason and I. Uh, I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, or as I like to call it in my ongoing discussion with Colt, the Certainly Superior Bible. Uh, Colt and I have just a little disagreement on on what is the best version of the Bible, and uh, Mason asked him earlier who would win, who was going to win in that that argument, and um, so some threats of violence were thrown out, so I don't don't know where this is going here, but... uh, I would love for you to open your copy of God's Word, whatever version it may be, as long as it's not the message. And um, I would love for you to stand with me to give honor to the reading of God's Word. There is some gold in this text for us today, church. I've been, been challenged by this this week and consistently going back to how practical Paul is going to get here in this first in this fourth chapter. So let's let's open God's word together. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read through verse 7. He says, "So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Euodia and I urge Suntuke to agree in the Lord." Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again. What, church? Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Father, we we have come to you again and again and again during this service. Barry has, has petitioned your name in prayer. Jordan has come to your throne as well, and now I do. And Lord, may prayer in our service not be a just a a time to transition from one element to the next or just a a piece of our liturgy. But I pray, Lord, that we would understand that we are here to meet with you, that we know that through your Holy Spirit, you are among your people, that you are not a God who is distant, but you you are closer than our own hearts. If we believe in you and we have been justified by the work of Jesus on the cross, then your Holy Spirit indwells each of us. And so we testify together that Jesus is Lord this morning. We lift his name high. We pray that out of all the distractions and disruptions that the enemy wants to sow and and accomplish in and among our, our congregation this morning, I pray that you would build walls around us so that we would clearly see your word, that the Spirit would illumine each and every one of these words, and that Jesus would be lifted high and that we would behold our risen Christ. We love you, Lord. And, and we understand as we come to you in prayer that we are needy people. I pray this morning, uh, just knowing that there are people in our congregation who are sick and who are hurting and who are dealing with difficult times and, and struggles that maybe nobody else knows but you. I pray knowing, Lord, that you are good. You are a good Father who loves your children. And I pray that we would come to you in a spirit of dependence and thankfulness. I thank you for your word, and I pray that today it would transform us as you seek to sanctify us. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. All right, let's go to our text. 
Philippians chapter 4, the first seven verses. Man, this is so beautiful. This is so practical, and this is so necessary for the church today. Paul is in the fourth quarter here, okay? So he's in the fourth quarter of his book. He's reached the last chapter, and he's in the fourth quarter of his life as well. He's, he's nearing the end of his life, and you know what happens often when you're watching sports, what happens in the fourth quarter of the game. Sometimes in the beginning of the game, people are, are kind of just piddling around. Maybe they're not playing as hard as they could be. Even though their coach is yelling at him, it's like, come on, let's get going. But then all of a sudden, you get into the fourth quarter, and what do you see, church? Let's go. You see this this spirit, this attitude of there's no more time to waste. I've got to get this done. We've got to grind out a win. You see the passion intensify in this moment. And that's what we're seeing here in Philippians chapter four. Paul's got these very few verses left. We've got 23 verses left in this in this story that he's telling in this letter that he's writing to this church. And so we're going to see his attitude kind of ramp up the intensity of his arguments and his instructions ramp up. His words become more focused, more intense and super practical here at the end. He's going to give us some crucial instructions, not only for this young church, but also for our church as well. I want to look at a couple of things, and I did not tell Brittany I was going to be doing this this morning, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit out of order. Okay, she's looking at me now. She's like, okay, let's do this. We got this. Fourth quarter, let's go. First thing, I am going to start with number one in your notes if you're following. I want to see, and I want to be reminded of Paul's audience. Who is Paul speaking to? It's important always to keep in context what we're reading. So who is Paul writing this? Before you look at your text, tell me who Paul is writing this to. By by way of a roundabout 2,000 year history of God preserving his word, yes, Dennis, it's coming to us. It's for us, but it's written specifically to this young church, the church at Philippi. Look what he says in in verse 1. I just want to stop for a moment. I want you to tell me, look at the words of affection and endearment, the terms of endearment that he's using here. So what does he say? So then, my what? Love, dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, and what does he call them? My joy and my crown. And then at the end of the verse, he calls them dear friends. I, I, want, I just want to kind of remind us of putting this back in context that Paul is not writing a theological discourse to be taught in a seminary. What he's doing is he's writing a personal letter to friends that he loves. In fact, one commentator said, this little church was Paul's favorite And he reflects that here. Do you see? What if somebody came to you and talked about you in the way that Paul is talking about these believers? How would that make you feel? Somebody came to you, Jeremy, and said, Jeremy, you are my dear friend. You're you're my joy. It's a joy to be around you. Uh, I mean, now, normally, if you're as a principal of school, you're probably thinking, what do you want? You're trying to butter me up for something, <laughs> for something to get something from me. But the truth is that this is not Paul. This is, not, this is not flattery. He's not trying to butter them up for anything. This is his genuine heart for them. He looks at these people and he says, man, I, my heart overflows with love for you. And this is so important for us to, to kind of grip and grasp, church, because he's about to enter into some a little bit of tough teaching here. He's going to pull out a couple of things that would be uncomfortable if they weren't grounded in the spirit of love for this church. The people that you love, you invest in. You think about the people that you love the most in this world. Who are they? You can say their names or you can say who they are. Your children. Ah, oh, who loves their children? There's a lot less hands than I thought probably should have been raised <laughs> in that moment. Who else? Who do you love? Who do you love the most? Your grandchildren. Who loves their grandkids? Grandkids, who loves your grandparents? Yeah, we do. We all love our grandparents. Uh, Sophie did this the other day. Uh, she looked at me, and she, she has these moments of being so salty, but then some moments of being so sweet. And she looked at me, and she said, I love you, Dad. And it was unprovoked. I was like, I love you, too. And she said, and I love Mom. And I love Chloe, and I love Grandpa, and I love Grandma. And she just went through the whole list. These are all the people that she loves. We love these people. So when we love someone, what do we do? We invest in them. We protect them. We do anything for them. And so that's Paul's attitude toward this church. I, I want them to grow. I want them to grow in their faith and their devotion to Christ. He's not just writing words. You know when you're writing an essay, and, and you're reaching the end, and you have to write a thousand words, and you're like, I'm at 800, so let's just try to uh, start 
spacing this out and trying to come up with filler words. That's not what Paul is doing here. He's not filling up space. He's communicating his heart. So this is his audience. This is who he's writing to, this church, this young church full of Gentile believers, mostly Gentile believers. He's writing them and communicating his love for them. Now, Brittany, this is where we're going to diverge. I'm going to skip over number two in your notes, and I want to go to number three. So that's who he's writing to. And I want to look at number three, Paul's aim. And this is what he's writing about. Okay, so I'm going to show the beginning and the end. Skip down to verse seven with me. What is this all about? What is everything that he's saying in this section? What is it communicating? What is he trying to lead them toward? Verse seven, and the what? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So here's the goal. This is everything that he's saying. This is what he's trying to communicate. It's coming from a place of love in his heart, but he's leading them toward this place of peace. Church, this young church needed peace more than anything else. Like every other Christian community in the first century, they were being persecuted by Rome. Let me tell you how I know that, because it's not here in the text. So as we look through history, let's look a little bit at the town that they lived in. The city of Philippi was a very pro-Roman city. Now, you find some other cities where, they're, where they didn't want Rome's subjugation. They didn't want Rome conquering them, and so they resisted them. You see that in the city of Jerusalem over and over and over. But here in the city of Philippi, they loved Rome. They were pro-Roman. They loved the benefits that Rome provided them in trade and in all of these different things, in, in, uh, in protection, in industry. And so in return, this is what the city of Philippi provided to Rome. They provided taxes. They provided tribute, and they provided testimony. And by testimony, I mean this. Every single citizen of Philippi, if you wanted to live and function and thrive in the city of Philippi, every day you had to go to the temple of Caesar, and you had to worship Caesar as a god. You had to worship the emperor of Rome as a god. They would go into the temple, they would take a pinch of incense, they would throw it into the fire, and they would say these three words, Caesar is Lord. Now tell me what kind of problem that presents for the early Christian community. God is Lord, not Caesar. They were, they, they were right, they were worshiping idols. So all of a sudden, Rome, they're trying, to, they're trying to keep people in check through military power, but also through religion. And so you've got a group of people, this sect of, of followers of this Jewish carpenter, and they're small and they're splintered all around the known Roman world. But all of a sudden, you've got this group of people who has the audacity to look at Rome and say, no. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to bow my knee to Caesar. I'm not going to put the incense in the fire. I'm not going to say Jesus is Lord, or I'm not going to say Caesar is Lord. Why? Because they worshiped a better king. They worshiped a greater king. They would not bow the knee to Caesar because one day they were going to bow the knee, everybody, to Jesus. It says in, in, earlier in this book that we're studying in, in chapter two that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what church? Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have never faced a decision like this in America. Church, let's be, let's be honest. It, it costs us nothing to be here this morning. Maybe you had an argument with your family on how to get ready and how to get to church on time. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know it happens somewhere. You're like, we got here. I love when I ask somebody, how are you doing today? And they're like, I'm here. Like, okay, that's baseline. I'm here, I'm breathing, we're okay. But we've never made this choice that you never got up and gone to work and had to, had to choose. Today, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to either choose to follow the, the law, the Roman authority in my life, or I'm going to choose to follow the Savior that has called me out of sin and darkness and into his glorious salvation. They were being brutally persecuted. If you didn't do that, if you didn't throw the incense in the fire and proclaim that Caesar is Lord, if you chose not to do that, then you could be barred from the marketplace so you couldn't buy or sell anything in there. You could be barred from your own job so you maybe couldn't earn an income in, in, in the city itself. Uh, you could be taxed heavily. They could take unfair taxes from you. You could be thrown in prison. You could even lose your life. But you've got this growing group of people, and I love this, that the harder that Rome squeezes on Christianity, what happens, church? It grows. It doesn't stop them. You got people like Stephen who looked and they said, we were going to, we're going to throw stones at you until you're dead. And he says, bring it on. 
He looks and says, I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and he is what I need. So you've got this group of people, and they're being brutally persecuted. They're faithful to Jesus all the way to the very end. And I want you to see something here. Paul's goal in writing this is what? Look at verse 7. What is he trying to communicate to them? Peace. He wants them to have peace. Now, if I look at it just in my worldly ability to understand things, how do I achieve peace? for a people who are being persecuted. There's two things that that I could have offered them. In my flesh, I could have said, fight Rome. He could have told them, hey, rise up against the Roman oppressors and and, and win your freedom, and when Rome doesn't exist, then you'll have peace. He could have said that. He also could have said, flee. He could have said, hey, you want to have peace in your life? Flee to the mountains. Build a monastery on top of a mountain. You don't have to think about it anymore. You, don't have to, you, just, you just get away from it. But here's the thing Paul understood, church. Peace is not an absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of Jesus. You can have peace even in the worst situations in your life. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. He says, listen, this is a peace that he provides that you will never understand. You'll never be able to wrap your head around the fact that you could be dealing with the worst trauma of your entire life. You you could be dealing with uh, heartache and sorrow like people wouldn't believe. It's amazing to me sometimes that I look out at a congregation and I look, and like Barry said, a good-looking crowd today. I look and I think, man, on the surface, we got it all put together, right? Y'all, y'all have it all handled, right? You're all fine. Like, you're going through life and you're like, man, this is easy. I'm not struggling at all in anything. But the truth is, what we look at on the surface, what we look like on the surface, doesn't reflect sometimes what's really going on in our hearts. Sometimes there's real turmoil. And there's sorrow, and there's grief, and there's difficulty, and there's trial, and there's trouble. And we think, if, I, if, if somebody just knew what I was going through, then I don't know what I would do. But here's the thing. It's amazing as you look at this. Paul is saying you can have peace in that circumstance. You, you can have peace in the midst of, of, of the worst parts of your life because peace is not an absence of conflict. It's the presence of Jesus. Jesus told us, he said, in this world you will have trouble. So he's promising us this life is not going to be easy. But look what he tells us. Jesus tells us in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. So don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. This is what Paul's trying to communicate. It's coming, all of this is coming from a place of love for these people And it's going toward, his aim and his direction that he's leading them is toward peace that comes from God. So that's that's what we've seen, his aim, his audience and his aim. Now let's go back to number two, and let's look at the meat of this section here. And I want to see his advice, Paul's advice. Now when you read through verses two through six, it, it feels frantic. When you look at it, every verse has a different topic. Every verse is about something different. And it almost kind of seems like a grocery list. Like you're going and you're like, this is all random stuff. This is so quick and it's bullet points. He's just like, here's my advice and here's my advice and here's my advice. And so one thing we got to understand when he's writing this grocery list and putting it together, he's preparing a meal for them. He's leading them toward peace. The ingredients may not look like they belong together, but when you're going to see it all together, it's all going to flow from one thing to the next. And it's all interconnected. So he starts with love. He says, you're my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters. He ends with peace. And look at everything in between reflects those two words. He's firing off a list of specific and intentional advice for them. And I want to remind you one more time that he's not giving that advice to fight Rome to get peace or to flee Rome to get peace. Everything that he says in this section is intended to help them prepare to steel themselves, and to to grow roots down into Jesus to endure what's going on and be able to thrive in the midst of their persecution. So each bullet point I want to show is going to connect to the next one. The first thing is advice about their faith. Advice about their faith. Look at verse 1. So in the midst of all that nice, wonderful things he's saying about them, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, what is his piece of advice here? What is his specific thing that he wants them to do in verse 1? Stand 
firm in the Lord. It starts here. He's been talking about this the entire book. He's been talking about how they can keep their eyes on Jesus, how they can focus on the right things. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think this is where we diverge in many, many churches in evangelical Christianity today. We focus on all the wrong things. We're so focused on everything else but what Jesus intended us to be focused on. We get focused on, uh, on, on big names and, and celebrity Christianity. We get focused on the different little squabbles and fights that we have. We get focused on our differences in doctrine. We get focused on all these different things. But Paul says here, stop. The world is pressing in on the church. So what the church needs to do more than anything else is stand Firm. And I want to be honest with y'all, this is really easy advice, but really tough to live, isn't it? Man, I mean, like when somebody's going through a hard time, Clint, so you come to me and you're like, man, I'm going through this horrible situation. Can you pray for me? And what if I just came back to you and said, just deal with it? How practical is that advice? How helpful is that advice? How, how likely are you to come back to me if I give you that advice? He's not saying it like that. He's not saying, hey, just, just stand firm and then you'll be okay. He's telling them, listen, I've communicated my heart to you. This is all about peace in, in, in your own heart and in your own life. But he's saying this, you're not going to be able to stand firm on your own. You can't just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just grit your teeth and say, whatever the world throws at me, I'm going to take it. I, like that scene in Nacho Libre where they're training and, and, and they, they shoot the, the cantaloupe at him and he's just like, oh, and it hits him in the chest and explodes. Like, we think that that's what Christianity is sometimes. Like, if I just be determined and if I just do it and if I just create these habits and if I'm just strong enough, then I'll be okay in this world. No, the strength, church, where does it come? Stand firm in the Lord. It's not the kind of strength that says I need to be a lion and I need to just face up to my enemy. This is the strength of a child who's scared going to his dad and saying, keep me safe. Keep me safe. You know that moment when, when, when you're, just, you're just next to your parent. Have you ever been lost somewhere? You've been lost somewhere like did, did, you guys down here. Did your parents ever leave you anywhere? Tell me where they left you. At where? In a car? Okay, where else? I'm, this, I probably shouldn't say this on video. All right, this is not one of those uh, investigative uh, reporting. Uh, I got left at church one time. I, I fell asleep during a service, and my parents, they all just left. And so I woke up, and I'm like, it was kind of that home alone moment. At the beginning, you're like, freedom! And then afterwards, you're like, now this church is terrifying after dark, right? But they find me in that moment when they find you, though, and you're like, okay, now I'm safe. I'm okay, I'm protected. This is the moment. Stand firm in the Lord. It's not about your strength. It's about God's strength. So he says, go to them. This is advice about their faith. You gotta stand for something. A faith that doesn't stand for anything is gonna fall for everything. The greatest testimony that you can ever have in this life, church, the greatest testimony that you can leave behind is a faith that trusts the Lord in the midst of troubles and trials. You can say all day long that you trust the Lord. You can say it, you can speak it, you can write it, you can put it on Facebook, you can do all these things. But when the proof comes is when you're still standing and you're still trusting even when the trouble comes over your life. I've seen this over and over and over. I saw my parents in these worst situations of life and ministry. I would go out onto the front porch in the mornings and where would I find my parents? Every single morning. They were sitting together, they were drinking coffee and they were praying Every single day for 30 years now, they've gathered and done that. That faithfulness is a testimony that, that you could never have in any other situation. Stand firm. So this is advice about their faith. And when you focus on that big picture and you're standing firm in the Lord, and you're not getting caught up in, in petty little things, look what happens. I'm going to keep moving. The second thing is this, advice about unity. Advice about unity. This is some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture right here. Look at verse 2. I urge Euodia and I urge Suntuke to agree in the Lord. Okay, I know this is a, this is a verse maybe that we'd normally skip over because it's got some crazy, crazy names and different things. But let me just break down what's happening because this is wonderful. These are two women. These are two women's names. Something has happened between them that's caused division and it's caused them to be in conflict with one another. So Paul's advice is get along, come together, agree in the Lord. Okay, 
what's amazing is not the conflict in the church. That doesn't surprise us at all, does it? When you look and say, hey, somebody's fighting in church, you're like, what else is new, right? Because we've been conditioned that that's kind of the norm of Christianity. It shouldn't be, but that's it's the way that we've looked at things. Here's what's amazing about this. The news of their conflict traveled 800 miles across land and sea and reached the ears of the Apostle Paul. And where was he? In prison. Do, do you see this? this? Whatever this argument was, whether it was big or small, it, it left that church and it traveled across Europe, across land and sea, and reached the Apostle Paul in prison. Enough for him to stop and write and cement in God's eternal word these words, y'all better start getting along. Your parents ever say that when you're on the, in a car ride? You ever, get, you ever get threatened like, I will pull this car over? It's kind of a little bit the sense here, get along, agree in the Lord. Can you imagine, just for a moment, go with me. First century Philippi, you're in the church at Philippi, and you are one of these two women. The first time that Epaphroditus comes and reads this letter out loud. Can you imagine what that would feel like? You're, you're Uodia or you are Suntike and you look and your name is said and it says, I've heard about your conflict and you need to come together and agree in the Lord. How embarrassing that must be. Man, when a person gets up and goes to the bathroom, it's like every eye in the church is like, I've never seen a person go over there before. Can you imagine being the target of this? This would be so embarrassing. But I want you to be, I want to be clear about this. Paul is not trying to embarrass them. He's not trying to humiliate them. Where is he coming from, church? He's coming from a place of love. He loves these people, and he knows this, that division in the church can start between two people, and they can, it could can fracture an entire church. And so he, he, he goes to the, the, the core of this and says, listen, whatever differences that, that are between you two, you got, you got to come together. You've got to agree in the Lord. You've got to stand firm. If there's a fracture between two Christians, the devil's going to have a hand to get in and to cause more division in the church. So then he opens it up in verse 3, and he expands. It's not just the two of them that need to work on this. It's everybody. Look what he says in verse 3. He says this, Yes, I also ask you true partner to help these women. Okay, this is, this is interesting. This word true partner, your version may say true companion or something like that. We don't know who he's talking about here. That's a little bit infuriating as, as a person who studies the scripture. I want to know who he's talking about. He could be talking about a very specific person. Uh, he, he could be talking about, in, in fact, the, the word in Greek is susagos. He could be talking about a person named susagos. So he could be talking about that person, a true companion or true partner. It might be Epaphroditus. It might be the person carrying the message, although why he doesn't name him doesn't make sense. It could be the elder or the pastor or the shepherd of the church. It could also mean the church as a whole. They're all his true companions. He's used the same word where it says um, true partner. He's used that same phrase in, in chapter one to talk about their partnership in the gospel. He could be talking to everyone saying, hey, y'all work together. Y'all bring it together in unity and, and, and bring this together. Why? Because there's more important things at stake. Look at, he says, you may be in conflict now, but look what he says about them. He says, these two women, if you would just focus Look what they've done before. They've contended for the gospel at his side. Isn't that amazing? You're not talking about just you're not talking about just sharing the gospel. It's an amazing thing. But you're talking about becoming a coworker with the person who wrote more than half of the New Testament. He says, "This is you are so important to the mission that we're on. You've got to agree because you you're my coworkers. Your name is written in the book of life. Focus on what really matters." And church, when there's a lack of unity in the church, man, it can bring the whole atmosphere of the church down. It can bring the whole temperature down. It can create feelings of animosity where they shouldn't have been before. I've told you this story before, but in youth ministry, we had a, a feud that developed between two guys, and it got so bad all the others were taking sides and they were sitting on opposite sides and, and it was just back and forth bickering and arguing. And so I went, I was like, I'm tired of this. And so I went to Lowe's and I bought a toilet and I brought it in front of the youth building and I just sat it right down there and I put a big sign up that said, when you come into this place, flush your drama and flush your problems before you get in the door. Uh, some of them didn't take that well, some of them did. Uh, it was one of my favorite moments though. Lots of questions about why there's a toilet outside the, the youth building. 
Although, really, honestly, Cole, is, should there ever be a question like that? I mean, when you see the toilets, like, it's youth ministry. <laughs> That's what you see there. But in that moment, that, that was my goal. Hey, come together. We're fighting about stuff, and at the end of it, I got the two guys together, and they couldn't remember what started the argument in the first place. That's what happens in churches. Sometimes that lack of unity creates this atmosphere and this temperature that's unsustainable. But listen to me, church. When there's unity, joy is not far behind. When there's unity in the church, man, the spirit is different. The the attitude and the environment is different. Look what that leads us to. Number four, or verse four, the next thing is advice about their attitude. Advice about their attitude. So you guys get together, come together in unity, and then look what the next verse is. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Paul uses this word joy or rejoice 13 times in this small letter. It's a huge theme over and over and over. Tell me what the issue is when we're talking about joy, because what were the people facing? Externally, they were facing persecution. Internally, They're facing a little bit of conflict. So he comes to them with this truth bomb, and he says, listen, what I want to see in the attitude I want to see in the midst of all this is joy. The world doesn't understand that, does it? The world would never be able to look and say, if you're going through a difficult time, you could could have some kind of joy. Because what they equate joy with is happiness. Happiness and joy aren't the same thing. Happiness is a result of your immediate environment, what's happening right now. When I come home... And man, that kitchen smells so good. And Mindy's making something. It was like a random Thursday or something. And she made like this Thanksgiving dinner. And there was like roast and uh, mashed potatoes and rolls and all these things. I'm trying to just get you real hungry. And then I'm going to keep you here for a while. But I walked in. Doesn't that produce a sense of happiness? Like, it's going to be a good day. It's, this is amazing. But, but happiness and joy are two different things. Happiness is a product of your environment. Joy is a choice. You choose right now the attitude you're going to have about your life. And you say, but you don't know what's going on in my life. I, that's fine. You may be going through way worse things than anybody else, but you can still have joy. Paul says it twice. Rejoice. Where is the joy in your circumstances? No, where's the joy? It's in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Man, he's not giving us any wiggle room here, is he? Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, you know, for good measure, I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Joy is a choice. You can look and you can say, even in the worst of my circumstances, I will look at the Lord and say, you know what? The world may be against me, but my God is for me. The world may hate me, but my God loves me. Uh, Maybe my body is being broken down by disease and I'm dealing with some sickness, but in heaven, I will have this perfect, glorified, resurrected body and I'll be with my Savior for all eternity. There's nothing that this world can throw at you or threaten you with that should cause you any anxiety. We look and we say, I am content and I am at peace in what my Savior provides for me. He says, this is your attitude. And when you have joy in the midst of your trouble and your trial, guess what? People notice that. People take notice of that. Look at this next thing. He gives advice about their witness. Advice about their witness. Look at verse five. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. So Paul's not just talking about peace internally in the church. He's talking about externally with the world. Now again, church, this, this is it's hard to, to grasp because what, does, what is the world doing to the church at Philippi here? They're persecuting them. They're imprisoning them. At best, they're limiting their ability to buy and sell in the marketplace. At worst, they're killing them. And Paul's advice is this, be gracious to them. Show them the love of Christ. Don't don't let bitterness toward the world grow up like roots in your heart, but instead look at the world and realize that Christ died for them. There 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 are those among them who will come to saving faith in Jesus by your witness. Sometimes we look and we say, if only my problems would disappear, then I would be at peace, and then I would be happy. But the truth is, there's always going to be reasons for sorrow in this world. But there's always reasons for joy in what the Lord does for us. So his instruction isn't fight. Fight or separate his instruction is be gracious. When all of those things come together, and your focus is on the Lord, and there's unity, it creates thankful people. Look at verse 6 with me. The last piece of advice is advice on their thankfulness. Verse 6 says this, 
Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Did God know what these believers were going through? Absolutely. Was it a surprise to him? Was it a shock to him? Did he look down and say, oh, Philippi, man, I didn't know you guys were going to be persecuted. I wasn't supposed to do that. No, he knew it. Everything that happens in our life is ordained by a sovereign God. He allows every moment, every moment of, of joy, every moment of pain for our growth and for his glory. And so look what he says. He, he knows what they're going through. He knows their trials and their troubles. He knows the persecution and the danger. And so Paul's instruction is don't worry about it. Don't let the world dictate your joy. Don't let the world dictate your witness. You trust in the Lord. A heart that is truly at peace with God gives thanks in every circumstance. I, I, I think about this often uh, with my favorite hymn writer. Her name was Fanny Crosby, and she lost her sight. She was completely blind from a very young age. And somebody commented about her one day and said, man, I, I bet you wish that you could see. I bet, I bet that you wish that God would heal your blindness and that you could see. And she says, don't, don't speak for me. She said, I don't want that. She said, I'm excited about the fact that one day I'm going to open my eyes in heaven and the first face that I'll see is Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Joni Erickson Tata had a, had a horrific accident where her, her, spine, her spinal cord was severed and she was permanently, uh, permanently disabled and she could not walk anymore. And somebody said that same thing to her. Don't you wish that you could go back and, and change what happened and then you could have your use of your legs? And she said, no. She said, because one day I'm going to enter into the presence of my Savior and when I get new resurrection legs, she said, you know what the first thing I'm going to do? is I'm going to fall on my knees in front of my Savior. That's true peace, church. Peace that is not affected by our circumstances. Peace that's not affected by the, the, the changing winds and the, and the pressures and the problems of this life. But that we go to the Lord and say, thank you for what you've given me. This morning we have one thing to be eternally grateful for. And that's the fact that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the life that we could never live and die the death that we deserved so that he could raise from the grave in power and victory and offer us an opportunity to have a restored relationship with him. Church, I, I can preach all this and I can preach it all. I'm blue in the face. But if you don't know Jesus as your savior, none of this matters. You can't have peace outside of Jesus. Romans 5, 1. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the pathway to peace. If you're right now, your life is in turmoil and every single thing that happens to you, it just throws you into a tailspin. Maybe that's an indicator in your heart that you need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe this is a moment where God is saying, you, 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 you're struggling with everything because you haven't given your heart to Jesus. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. Praise team, I'm gonna invite you to come up. I, I'm gonna be very simple this morning. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, Come to him in faith today. That's my job. That's, that's what I do. I, I want you to know God's word and grow in God's word. But if you don't know Jesus as your savior, man, I want that privilege to lead you to faith in Jesus. If the spirit is, is speaking to you today saying, it's time to come. It's time to let down your guard and give your heart to Jesus. I would love to explain in more depth what that means. This time of invitation and response is for that goal. If you need to come to faith in Jesus, you wanna make a spiritual decision, you need to, to let go of some burdens here at the altar, I'd love to join you in prayer. If you need to join the church, man, this, this is a great time to do it as well. Respond, though. If you're sitting here and you're like, I am a believer and, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I want to live a life of thankfulness, then let's sing this next song in praise and, and glory to the one who saved us. Father, I love you and I thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. I thank you for the gift of Christ Jesus. Lord, I know that I am not strong enough to save myself. I am not good enough to save myself. I would never be able to do enough good deeds or, or things that would please your heart enough. I know that I am wicked and, and, and desperately in need of a Savior. And I thank you that the blood of Jesus covered my sin. I thank you that your, your work of justification cleansed me from all unrighteousness. And I thank you for every person in this room that has passed from death to life in Jesus. And I know, Lord, that there are some that still have yet to make that decision. And so I beg you on their behalf that you would lead them. That you would draw them in with cords of love. 
that they would know how much you love them and the great price that you paid to save them. I pray, Lord, that if somebody in this room is not saved, that they would give their hearts to you and that you would miraculously and sovereignly save them this morning. Father, I pray that we would be a church that is marked by peace. I pray that you would bring peace into the body, that in our, in our congregation we would have unity. I pray that you'd bring peace to uh, us personally. Lord, that as the, the waves of this world roll over us, that we would stand firm in you. I pray that you'd bring peace uh, to us, Lord, in order to be a good witness to our community around us. I pray, I pray for peace. Not peace like the world gives, but peace like Jesus gives. So I pray that over our church this morning. Father, work during this time of response and invitation, I ask you. In the name of Jesus.